Um, so now we are going to have a security talk. And this is particularly interesting because earlier today we had a talk by Mike Crosby about security as in breaking out of containers. And very often when we think about security, we think, oh, there are some hackers that are going to uh, get into my servers and now they compromise like my 500 EC2 instances or something like that. Well, compromising 500 EC2 instances is nothing. What if I told you that if you, place, if you play your cards right, you can compromise 500 million machines? Uh, so you're like, that guy is probably kidding. No, because if you can compromise the installer package for Firefox, the number of machines that you're going to compromise is completely crazy. So that's the kind of security that we are going to address here. And in a way, I feel a little bit disappointed that there are so little people, so, so, so few people here, because this is pretty important. <laughs> So if you, if after this talk you think that this is important too, you should spread the word so that next time we get a little bit more people. <laughs> Thanks a lot. And to speak about that, we have Justin Capos and Santiago Torres. So please applause them. Hi, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, I'm going to be talking about uh, work we've done on supplying the software supply chain with a project called Tough. Uh, and uh, at a point later on, my PhD student Santiago Torres is going to come up and help me because just like most professors, I need help to do the actual real stuff like the demos. So, okay, um, to get started, so uh, there is an attack vector that um, allows you to have administrator access on devices that you're able to go and uh, leverage its attack vector on. It's something that if you have network defenses like IDSs or firewalls or things like this, um, this, uh, th this uh, attack vector or this attack vector will bypass them. Those sorts of defenses are completely inadequate to defend against it. Um, it's something that's on basically every device anywhere. You pretty much name that type of device and this attack vector exists. You can use it to hack cars, you can use it to hack um, um, you know, little uh, embedded wireless devices like remote control cars. If your kid has a Barbie doll that she tells all of her secrets to and then those get passed along to the marketers so that she's a good little consumer when she grows up, um, then those sorts of devices are all, are all hackable by this as well. Um, and it's something that's already been used uh, many times by the best hackers in the world, the nation state actors that are out there um, that are responsible for massive attacks. In fact, this attack vector has been used um, in one instance uh, on an attack uh, that was done on South Korea's uh, banks and media companies and others that was estimated to cause uh, over three quarters of a billion dollars, billion with a B dollars in damage. So this is a very serious vector. Okay, so quiz time for the audience. Does anybody want to throw out, uh, raise their hand and throw out a suggestion as to what this attack vector might be? Yeah, software updates. Great. So uh, great. So this is dealing with software updates. And this is, uh, software updates are an attack vector that have, have had many victims. There have been many different companies that have had people break into parts of their infrastructure, have had weaknesses in the way that do, they do updates, and this has put uh, users for major pieces of software for major companies that are, you know, have really done an excellent job with security has put their users at risk. Okay, so um, one thing you might think is maybe, you know, there's an easy solution. Uh, can't we just apply crypto? And if we apply crypto, isn't that just enough, right? So, hey, we locked our bike and we locked it to something. Wasn't that, wasn't that enough? Um, well, you know, just like with the bike here, you can just kind of pick it up and, and walk off with it. Um, so, can we just use a simple solution? Like, can we just um, go and get a certificate and use TLS and, um, you know, or maybe self-sign a certificate? Uh, and do this. Well, um, that has a bunch of problems. So, you know, we go, we have our, our server here, um, and of course, uh, there's, you know, seems to be relatively continual attacks on, um, you know, implementations of SSL or even things in the protocol themselves. But even barring all that, um, what this does is this tells you, if you have uh, this, this green lock here, this is telling you that. Uh, your clients have managed to talk to this server to retrieve an update. 
But it doesn't say anything about the server actually having a valid update or knowing what the correct update is or that the server itself hasn't been compromised. So if an attacker goes and breaks into this, this repository where the things are stored, then they can just go and compromise all of your users, right? And, um, and TLS is doing its job. It's telling you, yes, they're talking to the server, um, and, and yes, you know, the data wasn't tampered with in the middle, but it doesn't say anything about what's happened on that server. Okay. So, so this fundamentally doesn't, doesn't work. Okay. So now we have the same set of clients here, but we're going to look at this um, using a different solution that, that uh, sometimes, that, that some groups uh, propose and use, which is uh, now we're going to go and we're going to have a bunch of GPG keys. And, or PGP keys. And so we have our developers and our developers are, are going to have uh, their GPG keys and their, our developers are going to be trusted in order to sign the software that our users end up installing. Okay. Um, but now you have the problem that if any one of your developers is compromised, then they can sign software that will be trusted by all of your users. So really all you've done is take this single server point of failure and really turned it into a whole bunch of developer keys that independently can fail. Um, one alternative configuration that people sometimes do with things like uh, GPG is they go and they say, well, um, what we're going to do is we're going to put our GPG key um, inside of somewhere like our build server, inside of an HSM or something and stick it on a build server. So it's in hardware, it's secure. If attackers break in, they can't take our, our key and, and put it on their own, you know, take it to their hacker basement and, and do evil things with it. But the problem is, is that if you're able to go and get on that build server and you're able to go um, and sign things on that build server, you can still go and sign whatever malicious software you want. So really, you've just gotten yourself back to this exact same scenario that you were in um, in the, in the uh, TLS SSL uh, case initially. Okay. So is it easy to go and provide security in, in a meaningful way where people can go and break into parts of your infrastructure? So it's not easy. Okay. Um, but is it possible to do so? Um, well, uh, yes it is. So we, uh, so I, I started a project along with some of my uh, collaborators uh, back oh, um, about eight years ago uh, to try to make a, uh, uh, a mechanism for doing software updates that was resilient to compromises of the infrastructure. So the idea here is that you're, you're going, you know, hackers are going to be able to get in to parts of your infrastructure. They're going to be able to break in to maybe your build server or they're going to be able to break in to um, some part of your package repository or break into mirrors. And the goal is, is that even when this happens, you don't want the security of the entire system to be compromised. You want your users to still be able to have uh, reasonable security guarantees. Okay. Um, the other main design goal we have within Tough is support, don't judge. So um, we know what a lot of people's uh, infrastructure looks like. Um, you know, I did uh, I IT a while for myself, uh, myself uh, for, I don't know, six or seven years. And um, we know that, that things tend to be a little messy. So we want to make it so that you can apply uh, tough in scenarios like this, that you don't have to kind of rip out all of your, your infrastructure and replace things and ha must do things in a certain way. It needs to be flexible enough so that you can get meaningful guarantees for the software and infrastructure that, that you, you have in your um, environment without having to completely change all of your processes in, in, um, and, and, in every possible way. Okay, because it's, you know, security is not a one size fits all. The sorts of mechanisms you might put in place for, you know, a, a small lean startup that's, that has a few customers and, um, you know, is, uh, is just getting off the ground, it would be very different than a major software company that's, that's uh, pushing, um, like, I don't know, operating system updates or things like this that would be used by millions of people. Okay. Um, and in the design of trust, we use, or in the design of tough, we used uh, four basic uh, principles in order to design it. The first one was to separate out responsibility. So you can have um, different, different keys, different parties in the system, and those different parties go and they actually perform different actions. Um, and so that a party that trusted for one thing wouldn't be trusted to do other actions. Um, there's multi-signature trust where you can kind of have the, the two-man rule for the keys in the submarine or split it up in a way like this where you have multiple parties have to come together to perform certain actions. There's uh, this concept of explicit and implicit revocation. 
And this is actually probably the biggest change from TUF from, uh, that, that we see from other types of security systems um, in, this, in this general realm, which is really um, key revocation and issues around revoking trust are a very central thing inside of TUF. It's something that we spend a lot of time on. It's something that's really like a, a first class consideration within TUF because we're assuming that parts of your infrastructure will be compromised. And one of the things you see a lot um, you know, in the web and elsewhere is, is that key revocation is kind of clunky and doesn't really work that well and has a bunch of limitations and it, it's been kind of cobbled together um, after the fact. Uh, yeah, and the, the final thing is we try to minimize uh, the risk that you have um, for individual keys and roles so that uh, a, a compromise or failure of one thing doesn't cause you issues. So let me walk through these in a little more detail so you can get a better understanding about how this works. So the first uh, principle of TUF uh, is responsibility separation. So um, what that means is, is that you're going to separate out the, the things that you, you know, the keys, like the the participants in the system, so they have different keys, and that the participants in the system will do different actions. And by participants, uh, these can be servers, your, your mirrors, they can be um, um, like actual humans that do certain operations. So to give an example of this, um, you might have uh, like a, a developer that's able to say something like, this is a valid version of this software package or this container or whatever it is. And they would sign with the key to say that, um, and uh, someone with a different key, uh, like you know, perhaps your the repository you're uploading it to, would say things like, uh, there has not been a change within the last so many days or hours or something to the version of software that's available. And what's important here is, is that the key from the developer can't be used to sign information about when a change was made, and, and the key that's used to sign information about when the change was made uh, can't be used to sign the package. If, if you did use the keys to sign the other, the other operations, then the signatures would be rejected. The keys wouldn't be trusted. So an attacker has to go, and if they're able to break in, um, they have to be able to go and compromise multiple parts of the infrastructure um, in order to, um, to uh, break into a system and cause damage to users. Uh, another um, uh, design principle is to try to minimize the individual key and role risk. So you want to make it so that the expected amount of damage um, that will be caused from an attack, you want to make that as low as possible. And a way to think about uh, the expected amount of damage that's going to happen is it's the probability of an event happening uh, times the impact of what happens when it does occur. So to put this in practice, um, there's a role within TUF that serves as kind of the, it serves as like the, the root of trust. It tells you the, um, the keys for the other roles in the system. And since this is a very, if this role is compromised, it has an enormous impact on your users. It has huge security implications. We want to make it so that the keys for this role have to be used extremely infrequently. So those keys can, can be stored, for instance, in like safety deposit boxes or stored, you know, you could use Yubi keys or things like this that you physically keep offline and only bring online, um, you know, occasionally when you need to perform certain actions. So it can't be something that you're constantly having to use. So, um, you know, conversely, looking at this differently, if you have a key that you're, you're constantly using that, um, you know, to do something like say, has there been an update in the last uh, five minutes, if it's always signing metadata to say that, then the impact of that key being compromised has to be very low. It has to uh, be able to cause very little damage to your users if something does happen. So, um, for instance, you might be able to say something like, there hasn't been an update in the last few minutes when there has actually been one, but you shouldn't uh, be able to go and tell them to install malicious software. Okay, um, uh, the third design principle of TUF is multi-signature trust. And uh, this gets to uh, kind of this, uh, you know, uh, having multiple people potentially have to come together to perform an action. So you may do this where you might have multiple developers that have to agree that a specific package or a specific container that you're building is, is valid. Um, you can also do this in, in other contexts such as uh, as a root of trust. This is extremely common in, in tough deployments that um, you have to have uh, multiple parties come together to revoke uh, trust in different keys. And so if a single key is compromised by an attacker and you have a threshold of two, um, then there's not any risk to clients. You can go and you can rotate keys and do things like this um, and, and uh, not have to worry about the impact on the clients. 
And the final is explicit Im and implicit revocation. And there's two ways to do revocation in, inside of Tuff. The first is explicitly signing new metadata that says something um, that says that uh, trust in a prior key should be revoked. So in the example I just showed where we had uh, A's key that was compromised and we had A and B, then um, if B and C were, were, if A, B and C were the three trusted parties there and you had to have a, a threshold of two, then B and C could come together and say, no longer trust A's key. Now there's a key D you should be able to trust instead of, instead of R's. Um, there's also implicit revocation where you can have metadata that has to be refreshed um, over time. If it's not refreshed, then after a certain amount of time, clients will stop trusting it. And this is really important because uh, some of the domains where Tuff is used it is uh, situations um, where there can be uh, nation state actors that um, control internet access that uh, you know, on behalf of some of the uh, participants, on, some, on behalf of some of the people who use the software. And the concern is um, because they have in the past gone and blocked things, like block access to security updates and software updates so they can better um, you know, gain access to private things on um, their citizens' uh, devices. Um, so we want to make it so that uh, it's, you know, that users are aware if uh, they're being fed stale information, uh, even in, on the behest of an adversary that can do network filtering in that way. Okay, so um, just quickly, so as a result, Tuff ends up with four roles. It ends up with a root role, which serves as the root of trust that uh, says what the uh, other roles in the system are. It gives the keys for those roles. There is a targets or a projects role. It's called different things by different communities that have adopted Tuff. And this is how you say, this is the image, this is the container, this is the, the file, this is the thing that you are trying to download from the system. Um, and uh, this role will go and delegate uh, often to different projects or different, um, uh, you know, or, or different uh, companies or different whatever to partition out a namespace and further delegate down to developers and others in order to um, indicate trust in specific packages or software, okay? Um, there's a snapshot role that is responsible for knowing the overall state of the files that are on the repository. It uh, helps to make sure that uh, you're not told that files that are out of date are a current version, so somebody can't go and tell you the most current version of SendMail is uh, 0.1 alpha or something like that, so you, this is what you should be installing. Um, and then there's the timestamp role, which tells you uh, when things change and uh, it helps to keep updated. Okay, so that's just been a, a really quick overview um, about, uh, about Tuff. Tuff is standardized and used by lots of communities. Um, it's been standardized by the, by the uh, Python community. It's actually, there's an automotive version of Tuff that's called Uptain uh, that uh, we just released uh, in January publicly. We've uh, built and worked on this in coordination with a lot of the uh, major um, automotive manufacturers and um, it, you know, despite it being released very uh, recently, there's already two uh, vendors that are selling uh, Uptain compliant products and there's many others that are uh, in the process of integrating the standard and doing things with this now. Um, we have uh, a lot of different communities that have already either adopted it today or are um, in uh, the late, like late stages of uh, adoption now. Um, and I'll talk a, a bit more about uh, that later. Um, one thing I should, and, and so as a result, there's actually about a dozen different implementations of, uh, of Tuff in different environments, um, and it's been heavily security audited uh, through different groups. In fact, if you go, you can find um, the audit for the Go implementation that was, uh, that's being used within Docker uh, that the, um, you know, they've gone and they posted the, the security audit that they had publicly up on their site. So if you want to go and take a look at this, you can look at it. Um, but Tuff itself is a standard that's an, uh, open, that's an open standard that's been developed in coordination with a lot of different groups across a lot of different parts of industry. And uh, we're very proud of uh, the adoption and, and, and help you know, and assistance that we've had from all the different groups that have, um, you know, have proceeded through integration of it. Okay, so now since we're here talking about Docker um, and we're focused on Docker, now the natural question you guys have is, is Docker vulnerable to these kinds of attacks? Um, and so Santiago's coming on up here uh, because 
Um, he's going to take us away and tell us a little bit about what was happening a long time ago in technology terms, which is one year ago. Uh, a little bit more. Okay. Uh, a little hello. more than a year ago. Yeah. Uh, okay. So let's play a little bit about uh, the things we like uh, on Docker and uh, see how things can go wrong before we actually show you that today Docker is uh, secure thanks to Tough. Uh, are you guys okay with this uh, with this size? Good, great. So I have a couple of containers here. Uh, something that I like uh, a lot about Docker is that I can just uh, download an image like this, and then. pretty much run it, and I'm pretty much done. I could do this to get something good. In, before this was, the th before Tough was integrated, then you could have that an attacker uh, could break into the Docker registry or your own Docker registry or Docker Hub or any of this, and you could be, uh, and replace the files in there to for example, give you a malicious or tampered image that you would run as, if, as a, in any other case. In this case, the hacker breaks into some simulated uh, vulnerability in the Docker Hub registry and it replaces our, the image that we just uh, launched. So now, if we'd like to pull a, an update and then run it, apparently we're owned. This is just because there's no way to know which is the image that we were supposed to be running, or fetching for that case. Today, this is not what happens. I'll uh, repeat the example in a little bit. So, re this is what we want. <laughs> the, um, today, Docker allows you to sign the Docker manifests using Tuff, so you can be sure that the image that you're downloading is the latest image, it's the trusted image, it's the image that was signed by the, by the intended party. To do this, uh, Docker Content Trust adopted uh, the tough specification in the following way. You have a root key that you have, uh, you're supposed to keep offline in a safe, uh, in a safe place, like a Yubi key or a deposit box, and you have a targets key that you will be using to sign your Docker manifests, your your Docker images, pretty much. The other keys are provided by uh, Docker Content Trust to sign and uh, attest that the, that the image that you just pushed is the latest image uh, that people should be downloading. Um, this is a diagram of the, net, of the network process. You will pretty much need to enable uh, Docker Content Trust as an environment variable, and then the API will take care of, all of uh, walking you through the process. We'll do this in a second. And then uh, on the bottom, you can see that uh, the process for updating is uh, pretty much the same as with any other package manager. It fetches the metadata to see if there's anything new to get, and then the root, the target role will tell you exactly which is the image that you want to do. So back to our example, instead of uh, Instead of doing it uh, like this, we can rebuild the image and we're going to push it with uh, Docker Content Trust enabled. What I want you guys to see here is I enabled this uh, environment flag there. Oh, wait, I need to do it on this screen. Uh, this environment variable here, that about this one, is pretty much all we need to tell it to. In the case of uh, my example, I have to also use our own uh, signing registry for the sake of testing. Now it's asking me for a password for the targets key because it's going to be encrypted. Uh, oh, for my root key first. And now for the targets key. Now we were able to push the image and have the Docker Content Trust server sign 
the manifest that we just pushed. So let's delete the image locally and go back to the attacker and try to repeat the same thing. In this case, if I didn't screw up the demo, which I hope I didn't, uh, we should be seeing that uh, we weren't compromised. And this is because even though the attacker was able to replace the data in the registry, he's not able to provide uh, root metadata, uh, targets uh, metadata files that tells us which is the right target to download. Um, going back to our presentation, this was Docker today. <laughs> Uh, here's, the, here's the matrix from uh, the Docker docs. They, assuming that the attacker was able to A, compromise the keys, decrypt them, and be able to uh, get the password for the, the credentials for the Docker Content Trust server, we would still be pretty sure as long as we keep our targets and our root key in a good place. And even though if uh, the target's key is, not, uh, is compromised, we have really easy facilities to rotate it and to update it without the user even noticing that something went wrong. Uh, the only case of game over here is the root key that's offline that you, you should be keeping in a safe place. Now, uh, I'll have Justin walk back and talk a little bit more about the future of this work and how it, uh, okay. how it's going to be so um, now I'm going to talk a bit about uh, things Tuff doesn't protect against, uh, because I want to talk about, uh, so we looked at where things were in the past. Um, we looked at uh, really how Docker has, has come and really is now at kind of the forefront of security in this, in this area. Um, and now we're going to look at a weakness that hopefully is going to be something that we're going to come and come back and talk to you guys about at DockerCon 18 about how this has been integrated. So um, first though, let's look at a typical way that you might go and uh, build and deploy your software. So, oh, sorry. So you will put your software in a version control system. You might go through some kind of, uh, you'll have a integration, a continuous integration, continuous deployment service that may or may not be independent from um, the, the, the software that you use to do your build process, like your React or whatever it is that you're doing there. Um, you go and you take and you bundle in uh, things like Apache, and then you go and you build a Docker container out of it. So this is a pretty typical way that uh, an organization might go in order to build and, and deploy their containers. But um, the thing that, that happens in practice is um, that people actually, uh, attackers have been very effective at going and breaking into these areas for major companies. So um, people have gone and broke into version control systems. They've gone and inserted backdoors in widely used libraries. Um, they've gone and, uh, and hacked into repositories. They've gone and taken software that was sort of in between these different steps of the pipeline and inserted um, uh, backdoors and done other things like this. So, um, and, and this is something that has just happened once again over and over and over again for major, major companies. So we could sit here for the next 10 minutes and look at things um, go up at about this speed, um, but we'll go ahead and uh, skip ahead here. So what happens, let's say that somebody does go and get into something like your version control system. They go, they get in, and they're able to put a commit in there, a bad guy does. Well, you know, then that may percolate through the rest of your system and now you've got this uh, hacked uh, container sitting up there on Docker Hub that has some horrible backdoor in your software, has some other problem, okay? Um, and all the talk that we've heard so far today and, and heard and we've talked with a lot of people because this term like software supply chain has really started to take off in the last like three, four months. We've seen a lot of people start to talk about this from a security standpoint. Um, and really what that's focusing on is that's focusing um, on a couple different areas. So the main area that we see, everybody who seems to be using this term is really meaning we're, we're scanning, we're doing something with Docker images and we're trying to use information we gleaned from Docker images to understand something about the security of the system. Are there CVEs? 
Uh, you know, are there vulnerabilities in the known libraries that are in there? And in a few cases, we also have people that are taking some information from like their continuous integration system and feeding it in, right? But what we're really interested in is a much broader uh, uh, concept of what the whole software supply chain is, okay? Um, and so uh, I'll, I'll talk a little more about this in a sec, but the idea is that you have a project owner, you have uh, somebody for your, your software that goes and says, this is the way our software is done. This is kind of the flow chart about the way that we develop software. We have, uh, these are our developers and um, every developer's uh, commits have to be reviewed by another developer before they get merged into master and um, you know, this, it runs through this system next and runs through that and it has to go through a linter and that has to do these things and so on and so forth. And then the different, um, so once you have that concept, that, that kind of blueprint for how your software is made, um, then what you have is you have a bunch of parties called functionaries. They're the, the, you know, what we call functionaries. These are the people that actually do the actions, the people and services. So you have something like a build server that's one of these, but also your developers are functionaries. Your developers go and say, um, you know, are, are, you know, they'll go and they'll sign commits and add things into this. And then what happens is, is that the end user goes and they download this metadata along with whatever software they're, they're getting, for instance, a Docker container or a software package or whatever else. And um, as, as after they download this, they're able to go through and they're able to validate that all of these steps were performed correctly. So they're able to do things like check that every step was correctly processed, that there wasn't tampering um, in, any of these, in any of these locations, and that means that the software that ends up inside of Docker, you have really, you know, very much like, since people have started talking about whole software supply chain, I feel like I have to invent a new term, but like it's really cradle to grave. I mean, you can, you can actually wrap your editor um, and make it so that when, you when your editor runs, you can actually go and start signing files as they're, as they're created by your editor, or edited by your editor, before they even make it into VCS, if you want to with this system. Um, so you don't have to, you know, you can, you can choose to do things later in the process and it, it works in very non-standard, very non-linear configurations, which if you have a big software company, you have a big software project, you know that, that making your software looks nothing like this. It looks like these, this horrible um, flow, uh, like massive flow chart uh, things with, with like uh, little tiny icons. Like I've worked with a couple of major companies that do this and it's, astounding how many, how many little boxes and how many things they have on their, uh, you know, how many steps they have uh, for a, a whole bunch of different reasons in order to go through this process. Okay, so in conclusion, um, securing software distribution is hard. And um, using Tough uh, is, you know, it seems to, it's something that is out there that's standardized, it's widely used, it's been heavily security audited. Um, and uh, we, you know, absolutely would love to have people, if they have any feedback or comments or concerns or issues with Tuff, uh, talk about them. There's been a lot of public scrutiny, a lot of use, um, a lot of different implementations available uh, of it. And, you know, if your company or organization, if you're doing something where you want to use this as well, that'd be great. Uh, Docker Content Trust already does this. So if you're using Docker, then um, uh, you're using, you're using Tuff. And uh, as I said, we hope next year we're going to be here telling you about uh, in more detail about how uh, Intoto has been integrated even earlier in your pipeline, hopefully almost entirely seamless to you um, to make you get much stronger guarantees than what you're getting today. Um, one last thing about talking with us with Tuff is there's an actual standardization process for making changes to Tuff. Um, you know, we've had a lot of uh, feedback from different communities, including, um, you know, a, a lot of uh, uh, companies in the cloud and container spaces. Uh, CoreOS and Docker have been very active there, along with a lot of automotive companies have been uh, active in proposing, like, very minor tweaks and changes to Tuff. So we now have an official standardization process. And, um, you know, we encourage you, if you, if you um, have things or you see things, um, if there's some issue that comes up in some domain that you feel you couldn't use it, talk to us about it. And we're, um, we're open to uh, working with you to make changes as it is an open source, uh, you know, uh, community run project. So thank you very much. Um, this is the team that was behind Tough and Intoto and I look forward to working and talking with you guys.
thanks a lot. Um, do we have a few questions for our speakers? Yes. So I was going to say the tough protocols looked like they were all signature based and not encryption based. So would it be the, would it be true that you could use other signature schemes like a Merkle Lamport skip signature scheme or something like that? Um, uh, so tough is agnostic to the exact uh, signing algorithm you use. Um, so there are people who use tough with like RSA. There's people who use it with um, uh, with uh, ED25519, uh, there's people that use it with a variety of different um, algorithms, especially when you start to get into things like embedded devices in the automotive space and they yeah. may have hardware that does certain things. So TUF is agnostic to, to what you do there. It's more a um, framework for how you reason and think about metadata to protect yourself against attacks. Okay. Yeah, that, that, that was just my question. Was it, it looks like it was all based on signatures and it wasn't doing any encryption, which would kind of break some other stuff, I think. So it, it, it's just signatures, right? Uh, um, yeah, so okay. uh, what we're trying to get here is uh, integrity and uh, authenticity yeah. guarantees rather okay. than protecting people from eavesdropping into like the network. You, yeah, now, yeah. now um, Tuff doesn't prohibit you from doing this and there yeah. are like, you know, the way that it's deployed in, by certain automotive vendors wraps that around, around the information that's retrieved. There, there's nothing that, um, that we're aware of that in any way stops that from happening. But we don't enforce the fact that, um, you know, that like a, a network eavesdropper couldn't see the, um, like the content of a package or something like that. Yeah. It, you know, some people in some deployments they'll actually just do the network communications um, that they're doing that uh, retrieve tough metadata and just do that over HTTPS just because they don't want people to eavesdrop on that information. But it's not like, um, it's not forced that you have to do that because in certain domains that sort of thing is actually um, difficult or damaging to do. For instance, you wouldn't want to do that between um, uh, components, ECUs, uh, they're called, inside of a car. Uh, because the, the network bus that they communicate over is uh, an 8-bit, like, horrible, super slow bus. Um, it's, it's, it's like, you know, it's, it's worse than the old 10-base T out of, the, out of the 90s where you used to just run a copper wire, but very much, you know, in the same vein. So it's, uh, you know, so, so we have to be mindful of the deployment considerations of different communities. Okay. Thank you. Hey, so is it exposed to replay attacks? To replay attacks. Oh, uh, so no. Um, so uh, one of the things that we talk about in a lot of detail on the Tough site is we actually walk through a whole bunch of different uh, types of attacks. Uh, replay attacks, rollback attacks. There's a, a subtle type of replay attack called a mix and match attack and, and so on. And we talk through the threat models of exactly why those attacks can't occur in certain domains. And um, so the, the only situation where you have any sort of, so the sort of situation you have is you have a vulnerability to a weaker type of replay attack called a freeze attack in some cases where you have certain compromises. And what that does is that prohibits you from seeing new updates, newer updates, but doesn't, doesn't have you roll back or, look, or uh, obtain older metadata than what you've seen. So Tuft is resilient to all those types of attacks and, and you know, which are subcategorized because they make, you know, they, they behave differently in different cases along with a bunch of others. Thank you. Sure. Okay, we can take one last question and then if you have more questions, you can always ask Justin during the break, of course. Thank you. Uh, I enjoyed your talk. Um, yeah. I was wondering if you considered multi-factor authentication, uh, you know, integrating that into Tough? Um, sure. So you can use, okay, so the way that the users end up authenticating them to something like a server that stores their keys or end up uh, authenticating themselves to a device is not something that we um, ha enforce in the tough spec because we kind of get in there on in the um, um, like the 
you know, on the, the point at which you're signing the metadata. That's the aspect we enforce. However, the reference implementation for Tuff, as well as several of the implementations, support um, different uh, aspects that use uh, things like, you know, well, YubiKeys or use other aspects like this that people use for two factor authentication. So it's one of these things that we support but isn't sort of uh, forcibly required because there's domains in which. Um, this this would not fly for a segment of the of the population. Thanks a lot. Right. Thank you.